Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Ryan Fahey from Fahey Consulting. And he's the author of How to Thrive in Remote Work Environments. And he and his wife actually are digital nomads as well. And I'm really excited to uh, have individuals in the community come on to the show and talk about their experiences, talk about the work and inspire and educate the guests. So Ryan, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. And for everyone listening in today, welcome. This is going to be a fun episode. I'm excited to be here. So thanks for having me. Yeah. So we'll start off by introducing yourself, what, how you got there, what you do, and I'm really excited to dive into the conversation. Yeah, for sure. So just a little bit about me, I guess. I grew up in Eastern Canada and currently live in Eastern Canada now as well. My wife and I have lived all over the world. We lived in the Middle East. We lived in the U.S., in Western Canada, Central Canada, and now Eastern Canada. Um, I've always had this remote work background in me. I guess when I started my career, I have had some hybrid uh, working roles. And just to give listeners a bit more kind of context of the work that I do, I really work in the wellness education space within uh, non-for-profit education, but also outside of that with my business. So that's the area that I come at everything with is this idea of wellness and what, what does wellness look like for me? What does it look like for other individuals out there in the world? So long story short, just like everyone, when COVID-19 hit, my, my full-time work went remote. And being a person who's very optimistic and very much on top of their own well-being in terms of what they need, I was really struggling and I was really having a hard time keeping up with my fitness routine, keeping up with my health and wellness. And I was looking around to see if there was any books out there on the market that would support me. And there was one book and it was by an author called Jason Fried. And he has a book called Remote and uh, it's been around now for a few years a fantastic book, but there was really, outside of that, not much on the market to support the individual well-being of folks working remote as they're navigating things like a pandemic. So I ended up writing a book on that and, and myself have continued to work remote going on, I think, four or five years now, full-time, and then about 10 years part-time when you add it all up. And yeah, it's a lifestyle that works for my family and I absolutely love it. Yeah, that's, that's a great story. And the more I talk to entrepreneurs, the more people are wanting more control over their time and where they live and their freedom. And, and that recently there was a quote by Elon Musk saying that jobs in the future are going to be optional. And it's people that are wanting to do work that they want to do as opposed to have to, which is really interesting. Moving forward is talk about your book, How to Thrive in Remote Working Environments and kind of talk about the, what is it that remote working environments why do people fail and what were the traps that cause you to fail and how do you identify those? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, each individual is, is different and each work, everyone's work is different. And I'm very fortunate to do work that I love uh, and that I'm passionate about as well, which makes it easy or easier. But I think some of the common challenges that, that folks face, and this was bubbling up to the top uh, during the pandemic was just the ability to set boundaries, right? We saw governments stepping in Portugal, uh, in France. uh, There was a government stepped in there to protect individuals. So I think it was at the time, employers could not send emails prior to 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m. that was work-related. And so there was a bit of that. But outside of that, what, what I try to mention in my book and talk about is the power that we have to enforce or reinforce our own boundaries as well. So we can't always just sit around and wait for government to do something. Sometimes it's good for us to take the reins if we want to protect ourselves and take care of our well-being. So I talk a lot about that. One of the things that I talk about as well, and this isn't just unique to my work, but it also comes up in James Clear's book uh, on atomic habits. He talks a lot about the habit cycle, right? We have our cues things that trigger uh, certain habits or certain behaviors. And so in our remote work environments, that's one thing I talk about quite a bit is finding that psychological trigger that allows you to turn on for the day and turn off for the day. It can be very simple. For example, even in my own context, my psychological trigger is the clicking of the light uh, on the lamp uh, that's on my desk. So When I turn that on to start the day, I immediately go into work mode. And then at the end of the day, when I turn that off, 
I can be a husband. I can be my uh, a dog to my dad. I can, or sorry, a dad to my dog. I can do all the things that need to be done. That's something that I think is really important as well. And then a third thing, if I can mention it here, Chris, is just uh, there was a lot of common misconceptions early on with this whole remote work uh, experiment uh, of the remote workers distracted. There's stuff going on at home, but those distractions also exist in the workplace, right? I, prior to the pandemic, I was in an open office culture and there were tons of distractions. And I actually find now that I work better and I'm more efficient in the remote environment because I don't have all those distractions around me. There's other distractions, but regardless of where you work, it's about mitigating those distractions, doing your deep work, doing your focus work, and then calling it a day to take care of your own needs and your own well-being. Yeah, really interesting. It reminds me because when you were talking about government and kind of it was ingrained to me to see where the government is doing and going and actually being proactive because I don't know about Canada, but that's the United States has a history of messing things up when they get involved. One thing that's really interesting thing as a nomad, because I'm here in Buenos Aires and we're talking about it, is like this idea of like when to stop work, it's like kind of this blur. And like you talked about this, these triggers, but what is a good wind down routine or habit that you recommend or you advocate? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think For you, for me, for others that work in that kind of that mental work that we do, it's mentally taxing. I think if you do that type of work where you're creating a lot, you're writing a lot, doing that type of work, there's definitely that wind up and wind down phase. And one of the things that I talk about in my book is just the idea of, I call it contextual scheduling. And you just block large periods of time in your calendar to do deep work right? Because sometimes it takes us a while to get into that. We have to do maybe some surface work first to then get get into that deeper work. And I'm no, by no means an expert on deep work. Cal Newport, he has a great book on that as well. And he really has that, that figured out. But similar, I guess, figuring out what patterns work for you. So for example, I do my best deep work in the morning, typically mid morning, But then when I get later in the day, I have to do surface level work because I'm just mentally so tired from all of the deep work. And so I try to stack those tasks later on in the day that maybe are just email communications or filing, things like that, just later in the day. And again, I'm very lucky with the work I do and everyone is different, but that's just something that that I've seen that works really well. On the personal front, in the book, I have what I call the five-step energy amplifier blueprint. And that blueprint is more of how do we even set ourselves up so that we can be our best selves at work. So I talk a lot about priming our days. I talk a lot about evening routines, mid-morning routines. And it's just a blueprint that folks can take and kind of mold into their own lives. So it's a series of questions and suggested actions that people can take just to help keep them in those states where they can thrive in the work that they do. And so I've heard some really good feedback on that. And and I just really think that it's about finding our rhythm, finding our pattern and working through that. And then uh, follow up to that idea is now I see a lot of these called co-working spaces and it's like you can rent a desk for the day or you can, for the month, you can have it. And that way you don't have to buy or purchase or lease office spaces, like more of a, and how do you, what are your thoughts on having a dedicated co-working space versus, you know, because you're Now your home or wherever you live is like you're living and you're working space. So are there, what are the pros and cons to those two options? Yeah, it's a great point. And I've, (laughs) I've explored some of that too. And what's interesting when we look at creativity, sometimes creativity can be really birthed in new spaces, right? Some of my best ideas actually come at the airport or sitting on the plane, right? And so... It's a matter of capturing that and and capturing, okay, maybe I need to be in an environment today that has white noise in the background. Maybe I just need to be around people, even if there's not a lot of conversation, right? Um, And so it's figuring out again, what works for you. So even now I try to take one to two days a month and just go work in a public space, just so I'm around people, around noise, around different environments. And I find I work differently and I work more creatively when I step outside of my normal day to day. And I think that's true for in office, right? That's why we have team retreats. That's why we have big strategy meetings. And sometimes they're in lux- luxurious parts of the world. So I think it's the same sort of uh, idea there, except doing it maybe on a more micro scale. So I think that's that's something to to consider. 
And the other thing too, is that we are social beings by nature, right? Like it's just part of who we are, even if we're introvert. And there was, I think there was, there still are some alarming statistics around loneliness in North America. A lot of people are struggling with that. And I think if you do work that is more isolating type work, Outside of that, finding community groups, finding a community run group, finding a community group that plays board games one night a week or something like that. I think that's important for folks to remember. And it's something I talk about in the book too, that making sure that we're filling those those social and emotional buckets because we need to, right? The work that we do is taxing sometimes, right? Yeah, I love that. How does, you know, traditional, like traditional work-life balance, because like, for example, my wife, she's a W-2 in like, Basically, when she takes a vacation, it's a vacation. Whereas like kind of me, I can, you know, I can take one day off and I can get back. Whereas one day off for her is not enough. She has to have two, three weeks to recuperate. So how does work-life balance play in remote work and digital nomadism and all of that? Yeah, I think that's such a great question, Chris. And I wish I had a silver bullet for that. Um, <laughs> one of the things I know works really well for me is say like, we, we, we're very blessed. Like we live right next to nature. We have trails all around us. We're 10 minutes from five different beaches. So I find for me, just getting into those environments, getting into nature as often as possible really helps with that rest. But to get to true rejuvenation is hard. And there's a difference there, right? And I think that's what you're talking about. And one of the things that my wife and I intentionally do is every quarter we try to go to the spa together. And we block the day and go to the spa. And again, we're very fortunate to do that. But I find I can actually rejuvenate at some something like that. So maybe that's something that, that folks can explore. But I think if you can, finding periods or moments within the calendar year where you can have uninterrupted blocked off time just for you, just to have that rejuvenation, just for the time. Uh, and the energy that you need for the other things that you want to, that, or sorry, that maybe fill you, I think is important. And again, it's very challenging from situation to situation, but I, I guess if I could recommend something, it's getting into nature more often and getting to the spa more often <laughs> if you can do it. Yeah. There's, yeah, I love nature, like nature baths and just like I find that, you know, going to like art museums and you just become inspired and just for something, being in that environment sparks your creativity. It's really fascinating. And up in Canada, there's a famous Scandinavian spot where you can do hot, cold plunges and it's like your, your nature and they don't allow cell phones. And it's, it's a great way. Really interesting. If, if people wanted to find out more about you and um, check out your book and follow your social media, how would they do that? Yeah, so definitely I'm on LinkedIn. So folks can just find me there. You can just search my name on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm still on X. I don't know if people are still on X or not, but I'm still there. So you can find me there at Wellness RF and, and I have a Facebook page as well. So you can just search my name on Facebook, Ryan Foy, and you can check me out on Facebook. Those are probably the primary ways. And I do have a website as well. You can just Google my name and, and my website will pop up there. But uh, happy to chat with folks too. I find that I find these ideas fascinating to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's, I think Tim Ferriss is for we four hour work week. And then the other books like Cal Newport and Jason Freed and all these really um, thought leaders on how you view time and how you view freedom and the different types of freedom. All these resources will be in the links and show notes. And let's thank Ryan Foy for coming on and sharing his expertise and be sure to check out his books as well as give his socials a like and follow. And thanks so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this talk. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. And for everyone listening in, have a great day and be well.